Hello, and welcome to a very special episode of Breaking It All Down on Count Zero. By very special episode, I don't mean I won't be recovering from alcoholism or drug addiction or dealing with an abortion or anything like that. No, no, I will be talking about a movie today. A movie which I just got out of seeing, and I which I left early because it's a bad movie, but I'll get into that. That film is Battleship. Now... I've had a kind of charmed life when it comes to seeing movies in theaters. I've seen bad films. I've watched them on Netflix Incident, on television, on movies I've rented from the um, video store, or checked out from the library, or gotten from Netflix or whatever. I have seen bad movies. I've seen very bad movies. I've seen them deliberately. I've seen some not knowing what I was getting into. But when it comes to seeing movies in the theater, I have generally done a good job of researching the films and checking things out in advance to see how good or how bad they really are. Now, not to say every film has been 100% great. I mean, I saw episode 2 in theaters that has its problems, but it has its good points. It has things to make it enjoyable, whether it's Yoda fighting, whether it's... Um, well, it's one of the fact that Christopher Lee is in this movie and Christopher Lee couldn't half-ass a performance if he tried, or any other thing, any of the other of those things about that movie, which make it a little better. But, no, Battleship is something else. I think what says a lot about this film, I made it the first half of the movie before I decided to leave. And by the first half of the movie, only by, by the end of that first half, when we get to, like, the hour mark of an hour and ten minute, of a two hour and ten minute movie, do we finally actually see a battleship? Do we actually see a warship and have characters standing on the deck of this warship? This is not good. Do put another comparison here. By the, compared to the other various naval, the naval, but there's Hasbro movies that have come out this far, um, in terms of the G.I. Joe films and the Transformer films, by this point in those films, we've had one, if not two, action sequences in these action films. Um, in Transformers, we in particular, Transformers 1, by this point, we'd had the... Um, it was like the sound wave attack on Air Force 1. Um, we had Scorponok in the desert... And we had uh, Bumblebee fighting um, the cop Decepticon. I forget what his name is. That was in Transformers. That wasn't that we'd had all of these in the first hour. These weren't all necessarily super long fight scenes, but they'd happened. They they they'd taken place. We'd seen an action scene, and it was enjoyable. On the other hand, here hour into the film. We've had stoner comedy hijinks, basically. We've had, um, we introduced how, why the aliens came to Earth. It's basically a, it's kind of, it falls into, how to put this, in science, when it comes to science and films, it comes into two categories. It's either Frankenstein, postmodern Prometheus, what hath man unleashed, or it is the, wacky wingnut scientist who no one believes, who knows what's really going on, and has to persuade people to listen to him to avert the coming disaster kind of stuff. So, to put it another way, it's either, well, it's either Dr. Frank, Victor Frankenstein on the bad end, or on the good end, it's, um, well, it's, um, Jeff Goldblum in Independence Day. Well, this is on the Dr. Frankenstein end, because we start off right at the beginning of the film with um, talking about the NASA Beacon Project, which is the idea is we found a planet that is within the Goldilocks area 
around a um an, an, around another star, which means theoretically this planet is capable capable of having life forms on it, and so we are sending a signal out to them, hope just to say hello. And the idea is, like if a scientist say outright, oh, you know, if the aliens come here, it's going to be like Columbus and the Indians, only we're the Indians. Now, to be fair, Professor Stephen Hawking has said this as well. And it is a kind of reasonable concept to have. The problem is, well, <clears throat> I don't, i put this, when every depiction of alien first contact with humans in science fiction movies, with the notable exceptions of films in the Star Trek series, involves alien invasion or some other the aliens are trying to kill us kind of thing, having the if, if we're if we're to have the aliens not be hostile would make for something significantly different. Um I mean, they for a nice change as opposed to aliens show up, clearly they're invading, we must destroy them. Now I've read an alternate interpretation, which I'll get into later, about how this movie actually turns out, but we'll get to that in a bit. But the majority of the first half of the film is wacky stoner hijinks involving Alex Stone, a 26-year-old slacker who has no money to his name and no inclination of doing anything with his life, not going to college, not getting a job, not even hosting an internet video review show, um, and who just messes up so much that his brother ropes him into the Navy, which somehow manages to put order and organization into his life. On the plus side, whether or not this would actually straighten up his life, or if he ended up dropping out of the Navy. Because, believe it or not, you can get kicked out of the armed forces for misbehaving. So it's not like you, 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 not like you join the military and suddenly you find order and organization and logic to your life. No, no. You still have to take the steps on your own. But So that's part of the problem there. Um, we then skip forward some time. And we get to a the RIMPAC military exercise, which is basically a whole bunch of Pacific Rim countries getting together for a joint military exercise. I don't know if this thing actually happens, but it it's okay, I guess. Um, it looks like this is a real thing that exists. Yeah, this is an actual real thing that exists. Um, with the Joint U.S. Navy, Marine Corps, Coast Guard, and National Guard, plus um, various other Pacific Rim countries like Australia and Indonesia and Japan, um, all this sort of stuff. So, uh, South Korea. But, well, this is the thing. So, props for that. But this is leading to my next point, which is the film doesn't know what it wants to be. Because at the beginning of the film, we get three little major plot threads, which could become a, which could become a major plot on their own, but they on their but separately, it seems weird. A plot is um, through the alien thing. This is what they play up in the advertisement, the trailers, and that sort of stuff. B plot is the joint naval exercise, and C plot is. Alex Stone trying to clean up his life. That's one plot too many. You know, Rimpack, you could do a whole movie about Rimpack. Um, in fact, we kind of did. HBO, I, I need to see this. I haven't actually seen it myself. I should. HBO did a made-for-television movie called Down Periscope. I believe that's the title of it. Um... The film features um, Kelsey Grammer as a um, Navy p 
pi um, Navy pilot, but uh, by a, a Navy submarine captain. Who, yep, the down periscope is the title. A Navy submarine captain who's gotten into one bit of problem too many, and is given one last chance to clean up his act, and thus he's given the, done sent them a bunch of naval exercises on an old World War II diesel submarine, putting up against um, nuclear subs and various other things, and he has to prove himself as a commander and his competence in order to keep his job. That could be interesting. Find a way to do this in terms of a in terms of this movie, um, where we're at the RIMPAC conference, and one of the, um, right, for some reason or another, the, um, misfit ends up in command of the fleet, or something like that. Um, figure out some sort of convoluted justification for why he is in the command position, and now this level of responsibility, he must rise to the challenge, prove himself as a commander, and prove that he is competent, and will, and Deserves to be in the United States Navy. There we go. There's your there's your movie plot there. Or on the other hand, um, drop the rim pack aspect of things. Have a carrier battle group on maneuvers when the alien fleet shows up uh, and lands. Drop rim pack. We have a carrier battle group. Possibly even have um, I don't know if I, find a way to get the get a battleship in there. Get the Missouri or some other battleship involved, just, but maybe have it be the ba the battleship is out there for the purposes of shooting a movie. They are they're what um they are loaded with not active actual weapons for um, combat. So for some reason they have to get some actual life ammunition, something. But find a way where the battleship is already out in the water with a carrier battle group with a battle group with it. To explain why the battle group is together to fight the aliens, um, pick one, not both. So there's that big thing. Again, there's just too much padding. Is the other problem is again within the first hour of the film, we should be on a ship. We should be seeing navy life in the first hour of the film. We should not be seeing wacky, stupid, crook story hijinks. We should not be seeing, um... We should not be spending time on the Rimpack soccer game. Which is odd. Because we spend a good, like... Oh, like... After we, I mean, after we get through the stupid criminal thing where the guy's gets roped into joining the Navy by his older brother, we then just kind of skip forward, and we establish, show him his, show how he is in the military through the RIMPAC soccer tournament with teams from all the countries who are taking part in the exercise. And it, it's weird. It has commentary. It has actual, honest to freaking God, play-by-play -play commentary on the soccer game. This isn't a pro soccer game. This isn't a collegiate soccer game. This isn't... I, I see no reason why this game has commentary on it. It's not going to be on ESPN Classic or ESPN 42 or anything like that. It's 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 bizarre. I want I actually when I came into this movie, I heard dumb things about it. But I wanted to give it a shot. I am I for like a large chunk of my life, from middle school through high school, I was a big military nut. I was into military hardware, military battles. Um, I like to watch war movies. I like to read books about what warfare was like. Um, Patton's War as I Knew It. I read several books by Tank Command... Um, Your Brazen Chariots is a book about um, British tank combat in North Africa during World War II. Company Commander, which is a book about um, U.S army in World War II. I was into what war was like. And the whole, not, the hardware and the tactics and all this other sorts of stuff. So I wanted this film to be something like Midway, except without all of the absurd amounts of stock footage. Or I wanted something like Tora 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 or Down Periscope. I wanted a film where if you're going if you're going to make a movie about 
naval combat, make it a movie about naval combat. Don't half-ass it. Don't make it a wacky comedy, which happens to have some naval combat in it, or an alien invasion movie, which has naval combat and wacky comedy. Just, just find a way to get the naval combat in there, and make that be the focus of this. Make the Navy, their vessels, which are on, in their own right incredibly cool ships, and make that part of the movie. Make that the focus of the movie, but they didn't. And that's disappointing. <sighs> So I get I left the movie halfway through. The rest of what I've learned about the film is through plot synopses and like I read detailed spoilerific plot synopses on various forum sites and Wikipedia, and it kind of says a lot that reading the plot synopsis in Wikipedia, the majority of the stuff that they talk about in the plot synopsis, as far as actual plot progression, happens in the last hour of the movie. If you go to Wikipedia and the entry for Battleship Film. Um, and you go down to the plot, the first two paragraphs, actually, I'm sorry, take that back, the first paragraph and a half of the film's plot is the first hour of the movie. The rest of that is, is the, the rest of the film, the second half of the film is all of the rest of that. That is way too padded. Just, if anything, either cut back on the wacky stoner hijinks. The best thing to do is just cut back, just dump the wacky stoner hijinks. Dump that. They're funny, but they don't belong in this movie. That caused about half an hour of the movie there. Within the first half hour of the film, we are on, we are in the Navy, we are on the exercise, we are dealing with the alien invasion stuff. We've gotten to it very quickly. Something like that. Fix the movie's pacing. So other than that, um, just want to briefly talk about the, the uh, trailers I saw at the film. Um, we had a bit there for most of these trailers we had seen before for um, the Born Legacy and various other stuff. Nothing that really stood out except for the trailer for Rock of Ages. I like rock music. I like metal music. I mean, I'm wearing a Rush t-shirt. You've occasionally seen me with an Iron Maiden t-shirt on. <sighs> this movie looks dumb. Rock of Ages looks really, really freaking dumb. Like, I'm not going to see this ever dumb. The film... It's a film about the, the late 80s Los Angeles hair metal scene that doesn't have the guts or the teeth to make it about the late 80s and 90s. Um, late 80s Los Angeles Silence at Strip hair metal scene. Because we've kept, we have hair metal songs like Poisons Ain't Nothing for a Good Time, and we have and we have Tom Cruise as like your standard hair metal lead singer. But on the other hand, this is a PG-13 rated movie. I, if you if you like go and decide to marathon a bunch of beho old behind the music episodes on. Um, Poison on Motley Crue on all these various other bands from that scene, Van Halen. You know, like, okay, all these bands had I mean, the sex, drugs, and rock and roll lifestyle. Near as I can tell, there are... This the film has the sex, toned down. This has the rock and roll, sort of. Um, it's, it's, more, it's more East Coast. Like, we have Foreigner, we have... Journey. I mean, Journey is Los Angeles. It's not Los Angeles. It's, it's it's West Coast, but it's not L.A. It's it's not hair. It's San, it's the San Francisco sound. It is a band made up of a bunch of people who are part of that San Francisco sound scene. I and mean, their freaking lead guitarist Neil Sean used to play with Carlos Santana. So they are old school. Um, it has Bon Jovi, which they are, they, they will tell you, we are from, they'll tell you they're from New Jersey. They are not West Coast. They are, they are like freaking Def Leppard meets Springsteen. Speaking of which, Def Leppard has music in this. I mean, the title of the film is taken from, and the musical it's based on, is from a Def Leppard song. 
And it's not like musicals aren't afraid to pull their pun aren't afraid to, to, to go full force and not pull their punches when it comes to topics like sex and drugs and that sort of thing. I mean freaking rent is one of the most popular musicals of all time, sort of kind of. And it's or at least it's the voice of a generation or whatever. And it's there are lots of it are related to homosexual characters and AIDS and drug use. So you can put the drug stuff in your musical, and people will still go see it. Um, additionally, the kind, of, kind of the dumb bit is most jukebox because I haven't seen a lot of them, but I'm familiar with the narrative structure of them, and I've read up on the plots of them. Most of the jukebox musicals, when they're using songs by ABBA or Billy Joel or whatever, when they use them in the context of the film or the musical, they are not having those be the original composition of the character. Um, it may be that in the universe of this, Billy Joel doesn't exist, or ABBA doesn't exist, but they are using the songs to speak for an emotional p uh, point in the character's life, to use music to express high melodrama. And it's the same sort of thing with opera and all the other sort of stuff. But here, because it's about rock singers and that sort of thing, we are having, well, we are having um, Tom Cruise on stage as Nicky Rocks, or whatever the hell his character's name is, um, singing Van Halen and Poison and Wanted Dead or Alive by Bon Jovi as if he'd composed them and performed them and made them hits himself, as if Poison and Van Halen and all these other L.A. glam metal scene acts never existed. It was just Nicky Rocks and these guys and all this other sort of stuff, and it's... It just made me go, what? What are you doing here? It, it, it's weird. And kind of dumb. Oh, and Nikki Rocks has, for some reason, has a... The, the character has a monkey. Because I guess Michael Jackson had a monkey. But Michael Jackson... The closest it had to do with the with that hair metal scene was that Eddie Van Halen did a guitar solo for Beat and the guitar riff for Beat It for free. I don't know. It it disappoints me, and I'm not going to be seeing that movie. So I never, and I would recommend not seeing it. You all don't see it either. So that's that. I've rambled on rambled on for about. Oh, 23 minutes, almost half an hour. So, I think I'm done with this. Again, next week will be the... Well, this week will be the Leviathan Wakes review. And we'll see how far I get along with Among Others by Joe Walton. If I am, to do double feature and get the best novel stuff out of the way. Hopefully this week, possibly tomorrow for Memorial Day, I'll try to get my first Let's Play of... Call of Duty Modern Warfare 3, or if you want to go the full nine yards, Call of Duty 4 Modern Warfare 3, get the first Let's Play of that up and with commentary and so forth and so on. So, I've rambled on enough. Till next time, I'm Count Zero. Thanks for watching.